evening, everyone. I'm Nia Johnson, a senior program officer in the Board on Life Sciences and the Board on Animal Health Sciences Conservation and Research for BASCAR, which was formerly ILAR and now exists in the form of BASCAR here at the National Academies of Sciences, Engineering, and Medicine. I would like to welcome you all to the Contingency Planning and Training of Personnel Rule, APHIS 2020-0101, One Year of Implementation Workshop. This workshop is being conducted under the auspices of the Roundtable on Science and Welfare of Animals Involved in Research, and I'm honored to have such a distinguished group of experts here today to discuss the different aspects of contingency planning at various research institutions. I would like to begin by thanking all of our presenters for joining us today and tomorrow. I would also like to thank each and every one of the committee members of the Workshop Planning Committee, and in particular, the committee chair, Dr. Susan Harper and Vice Chair, Dr. Leslie Colby, for all of the time and effort that you all have dedicated to work organizing this workshop. And without further ado, I'll turn it over to you, Susan. Okay, thank you for that nice introduction. Uh, it's my great pleasure to welcome all of you to this vital workshop that's focused on understanding the successes, challenges, and lessons that we've learned from the implementation of APHIS's contingency rule. As we kick off this workshop, our objectives are clear and compelling. We aim to share our implementation experiences, compare implementation across various research institution types, assess training program effectiveness and discuss active learning and preparedness training, review the roles of relevant entities, and discuss needs for further guidance to enhance the contingency rule application. Your presence here today underscores the importance of our collective mission to enhance the health and well being of plants and animals involved in research through robust and effective contingency planning. We have structured the agenda for our workshop to encourage discussions over the next two days that will be rich and varied, driven by your ex experience, insights, and expertise. Together, we will work towards enhancing our preparedness and response mechanisms, ensuring that we're better equipped to safeguard the health and well being of our animal populations. And now I'd like to introduce my vice co chair for this workshop, Leslie Colby. Thank you. First, I'd like to thank you all for your interest and attendance today. I encourage you all to engage actively, ask questions, and share your perspectives. Your contributions are invaluable to the success of this workshop and more importantly, to the advancement of our collective mission. Before we continue, I do have a couple administrative notes I'd like to share with you. First, if you have any questions at any point during the sessions, please use Slido to submit your question. We will make every effort to respond to as many questions as possible. We'll also answer questions during the Q&A portion scheduled at the end of and during the final Q&A session, which is scheduled during the last session of the second day of the workshop. Before we delve into the discussions that lie ahead, it's imperative that we set the tone for a respectful and inclusive atmosphere. The National Academy stand firmly against any forms of harassment, bullying, or hate speech. We believe in the power of constructive dialogue where diverse perspectives contribute to a tapestry of ideas. Thank you for being here, and I look forward to a productive and enlightening workshop. Now, without further ado, I'll turn you over to Susan. So um, the layout of our workshop is a two-day workshop. Uh, we're going to start today with some uh, introductory remarks by our sponsor and also uh, Dr. Taylor Bennett, who's going to be giving us some background on the rule um, and the experiences enforcing the rule. That's going to be followed by a survey, uh, the results of a survey that was conducted by FACID and also a survey that our um, committee conducted in preparation for this workshop. And then this afternoon, we're going to be hearing lessons learned from a number of different uh, very uh, Ex, uh, experienced and prestigious panelists in terms of contingency planning. Um, we'll pick up again tomorrow, hearing from people who have different roles in the animal program and what their experiences has been in terms of contingency planning. And then in the, uh, that will be followed by a session on education, which came up frequently in our surveys as a topic that's of great interest. And then we'll wrap up our workshop at the close of the day with an opportunity for question and answers. So we thought it'd be useful to start this workshop by producing, pro providing some background information regarding the contingency rule itself and get a peek into how institutions appear to have implemented this new rule as judged through recent facility inspection findings by the USDA. For this, we're honored to have two distinguished individuals, Dr. Luis D. Vicente, Senior Staff Officer for Research at the USDA, 
and Dr. Taylor Bennett, who has a long career in laboratory animal medicine and science policy. Dr. Di Vicente will be providing a brief overview of the contingency rule, including why it was proposed, what were the initial concerns that delayed its ultimate adoption, and what was anticipated to be the level of regulatory or administrative burden that it might impose on institutions. Right after that, Dr. Bennett will provide an independent report and analysis of public USDA reports with citations related to contingency planning and offer viewpoints on how compliance with the contingency rule compares to other responsibilities or requirements that are assigned to research programs. So our first speaker, as I mentioned, is gonna be Dr. Luis Di Vicente, who is the Senior Staff Officer for Research at the USDA. Dr. Di Vicente graduated from Louisiana State University School of Veterinary Medicine in 2010. He completed a residency in comparative medicine at the University of Rochester in Seneca Park, Slough in 2012, and was board certified by the American College of Laboratory Animal Medicine in 2013. Dr. Di Vicente earned a Master of Science in Clinical Translational Research in 2014. Uh, sorry, um, and was board certified by the American College of Animal Welfare in 2015. He worked in numerous academic and clinical practice settings before joining the National Policy staff at USDA Animal Care. So I'd like to take this time to welcome Dr. Luis Di Vicente. Thank you very much. Um, and I wanna thank uh, Susan and Nia uh, and, and Leslie as well for your help with this. And, and really, again, to emphasize what they, what they said in their introduction that we're really hoping that this is a discussion and a conversation uh, we are really interested in feedback from you all about, about the contingency rule itself, how we can improve it, and then for larger issues moving forward in terms of how we how we roll out new new rules and regulations from, from animal care. So uh, we really welcome your feedback and encourage the, the dialogue that, that this forum will provide, hopefully. So uh, I'm going to just talk about some background, some history, and, and sort of the overview of, of the contingency rule for the next few minutes. So next slide, please. So how did we get here? Um, so marine mammal facilities, for those of you who are familiar with, with all of our regulations, uh, have been required to prepare and submit contingency plans to us uh, for a while uh, regarding emergency sources of water and electric power should their primary sources of those things fail. And among, among other things, those plans are required to include evacuation plans in the event of a disaster uh, and a description of any backup systems and, and uh, arrangements for relocating marine mammals uh, that require artificial cooling or artificial heating. So that was isolated just to marine mammals for, for that regulation. And then following Hurricane Katrina uh, in 2005, uh, we saw the need for contingency planning for all animals covered by the Animal Welfare Act. Act. Uh, the lack of disaster pre preparedness can leave businesses and organizations and the animals in their care vulnerable, as was the case in, in Louisiana and other places following Hurricane Katrina. So animals that were on flooded ground floors in New Orleans, where, where almost 100% of the animals were lost. Then a report of re-examining the, the federal response to Hurricane Katrina identified the lack of national preparedness for catastrophic threats as the top critical challenge underlying the difficulty in responding to Hurricane Katrina. And underlying that, that lack of preparedness was an, an unfamiliarity with the National Recovery Plan and decision makers' roles and responsibilities under the plan. And so the federal government recognized the importance of organizing and training personnel to perform response roles in an emergency before the emergency happened. And so, so animal care's experience indicates that al although contingency planning would benefit the health and welfare of, of animals covered by the Animal Welfare Act, at, at least some of our regulated entities didn't take undertake such planning on their own. And, and again, the events experienced during that the 2005 hurricane season highlighted the need for planning and so, so there's more than 1 million animals reportedly used by research facilities. So, so there is a huge need for contingency plans to protect animals and mitigate the impacts of natural and man-made disasters. Uh, next slide, please. So in 2008, APHIS first proposed the contingency plan rule uh, and the, the final rule was published in 2012. 
after learning that a number of small entities considered the requirements of these regulations excessive for their specific cases um, and, and the agency determining that that claim was valid, we stayed the regulations to re-examine whatever unique circumstances and costs that might vary based on the, the type and size of business. So, so remember, we regulate a, a lot of different types of, of activities from not just research facilities to transporters are, are all, we're also required to, to contingency plan. And then our licensees, so our, our, our breeders, our dog and cat breeders, or our other covered animals and, and our exhibitors were also required to, to have a contingency plan. So we, we stayed that regulation in, in 2012. Um, then in 2018, we issued a, a de minimis exemption to the animal licensure requirement. So uh, basically exempting certain businesses that didn't meet a threshold for, for regulated activity, didn't have to get a license. So they didn't have to comply with, with the Animal Welfare Act. And although the Secretary of Agriculture may also exempt by regulation research facilities that don't use dogs or cats or substantial numbers of other animals, that authority hasn't been exercised. So, so all research facilities that use regulated species are, are required to, to comply. After that rule, a number of licensees did cancel their license, their license subsequent to, to those de minimis exemptions. And, and so we believe that those broadened exemptions address the concerns that led to the stay, that, that the, the impact on those small facilities was outsized. Coupled with um, in the consolidation, the Consolidated Appro Appropriations Act of, of 2021, Congress required APHIS to propose to lift the stay on the final rule within 180 days. So we we did that in, in June of 2021. We we made minor modifications from the original rule. And uh, of note, we removed the requirement for documentation of training and created an optional form to increase the ease of and, and decrease the time burden of, of making a plan. So in response to that proposed rule, we were, received 140 unique public comments with 138 supporting the rule, and most of those supported it without change. So that's that's pretty good for us in terms of, of, of endorsements for, for the rule. And so then it went into effect in January 2022. So we're, we're about two and a half years in now at this point. Uh, next slide, please. And so in, in our in our preamble to the to the rule, we explained why we thought this was important, why a contingency plan is important. And, and so safeguarding the health and welfare of animals in emergency situations is, is obvious. Uh, but mitigating the loss of valuable research resources and income is, is another consideration. As as you saw in that that slide with with the image of, of Hurricane Katrina, there was there was a lot lost, a lot of scientific value and resources lost in, in Hurricane Katrina. Uh, and, and other storms that that year. So uh, the, the contingency rule, rule really is meant to help businesses and organizations prepare for that and, and mitigate those losses. And we want to help reduce the time of recovery from disasters and, and provide cost savings to the affected businesses and organizations. And then just from a, a public perception angle, we, we feel like it's important to reassure the public that the facilities that we regulate have measures in place to ensure animal welfare in times of emergencies, especially those that, that are fairly predictable, like, like a hurricane. Uh, next slide, please. So, so we call it a contingency plan for, for a, a few different reasons. So the one of the, the main reasons is the, the terms disaster and emergency have specific meanings uh, within the federal government that's that are defined by Congress. So an emergency is and they're they're both determined by the president uh, as uh, declared emergencies or declared disasters. And so so the scope of this rule is meant to be broader. So we use the the, the more general term of a contingency plan to to indicate that that we're talking about lots of different things, not just these these specific things that have have a meaning for us in, in the in the federal government. So a contingency is is a future event or circumstance which is possible but can't be predicted. Uh, and a pro or a provision for an unforeseen event or circumstance. And, and so contingency planning as a process is something that analyzes disaster disaster risks and establishes arrangements in advance to enable an effective response. So that's that's what we're looking for. So next slide, please.
And so we recognize that individual circumstances for the, the, the broad range of, of organizations and facilities that we regulate are different. And so it's difficult to go into a specific detail as to what elements should be in, a, in all contingency plans. So when we wrote the rule, we, we chose not to try to develop a one size fits all plan and instead tried to provide a framework that we that we believed was the minimum criteria necessary to to ensure a successful contingency plan. And so so these are the four the four criteria that we came up with um, that well, I'll go into more detail as we go through. And, and these criteria are modified from FEMA's Ready Business Campaign uh, to address animal welfare concerns. So, so really, we didn't try to reinvent the wheel. We tried to take what, what we know from our other federal partners is, is successful and, and adapt it to, to our needs in, in our program. And we leave discretion for how best to develop contingency plans within the framework to the facilities. And as, as part of that, the rule, we also require annual review of the, of the plan and, and training for staff. Uh, next slide, please. So in our implementation timeline, we gave 180 days for the plan development and then 60 days after that for training. And then go moving forward, uh, facilities have 30 days to train new employees after their start date or, or 30 days to train existing employees after any substantive changes to the plan are made. Uh, next slide, please. In our initial 2008 uh, proposed rule, we estimated that it would take four to six hours to develop and document a contingency plan. And in that, in the final rule, we developed a fillable form to develop and document that the plan uh, to try to make it easier and, and ease that burden. And so because of that, that form, we estimated that it would only take one to two hours to complete the plan, the plan. And we did we did continue the, the requirement for training, um, but eliminated the documentation requirement to, to again try to ease the burden. And so we estimated up to one hour for training of employees uh, for the initial, both for the initial plan and for any substantive changes that, that would be made. Uh, next slide, please. So just going through some of the, 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 the key highlights of what the rule requires. So, so facilities are required to develop, document, and follow an appropriate plan to provide for the humane handling, treatment, transportation, housing, and care of animals. And so, so it's it's meant to be broad. We we want to cover everything that that animal is experiencing, everything that 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 facility is responsible for in terms of animal care. Uh, next slide, please. And then if we sh we we expect facilities to plan for emergencies or disasters that could be reasonably anticipated. And and so again, we recognize that a one size fits all approach isn't isn't going to be successful or, or necessary. So we left it up to the individual facilities to de determine which emergencies or disasters needed to be planned for. Uh, and so to aid facilities with some of the natural disasters, we, we provided a link to the US Geological Survey's listing of areas most at risk for specific natural disasters. Um, but, but again, trying to rely on the facility to, to go through a thought process that makes sense to them. And so a facility in, in Louisiana probably doesn't need to plan for earthquakes or wildfires, but they should be planning for hurricanes. And, and conversely, maybe a facility in California probably doesn't need to make a plan for a hurricane, but they probably should be making a plan for a, a wildfire. Uh, next, please. And so the contingency plan should include natural disasters as well as mechanical disasters and, and other events like animal escape. So, so again, the things that the facility is most likely to experience. And, and obviously like a tiger in a zoo escaping an enclosure is, is a different type of emergency or a different scale of emergency maybe than, than a macaque in a research facility escaping its, its cage, but it can still have impact on the animal, other animals and, and people that require planning to address it safely before it happens. Uh, next slide, please. And so the plan should outline specific tasks um, and, and include things like animal evacuation instructions or shelter in place instructions and, and provisions for, for backup power and food, um, veterinary care for, for animals that need it. 
Um, and it should include who's responsible for each task, either by name or title. So again, assigning responsibility for each task so, so people know what they're responsible for as before the, the plan needs to, needs to go into effect. Next, please. And then the plan must be reviewed on at least an annual basis, and we do require that there be documentation of that annual review um, if there are any amendments or changes made to the plan since the previous year's review. And, and so that might be based on experience with the plan or if, if something, uh, if there's a new or emerging likelihood of a likelihood of a disaster or um, or just just different processes that need to be in place based on whatever is unique to that facility again. Uh, next, please. And then th this probably is, is, I think, one of the most important parts. The, the facility must provide training for its personnel regarding their roles and responsibilities. So going back to, so again, the, the origin of the rule, the, the lack of planning and the lack of training and familiarity with, contingent, with contingency plans that did exist was a significant contributor to to the loss in Hurricane Katrina, and so so uh, we we feel like training is pretty important. Again, to minimize regulatory burden, we we took away the requirement for documentation of the training, and so we anticipated that and and still do that inspectors inspectors confirm that the contingency plan training is being delivered in a similar manner to their process for confirming that other required training has been delivered, such as for husbandry practices or veterinary care protocols. Uh, and so if, if you do maintain training documentation on your own, they might review that, or they might ask employees at the facility about the facility practices. So they might ask them about the contingency planning um, or the training that they've received. And again, we believe the decision of which individuals should be trained is a decision best left to the facility. Uh, that we would expect, though, that all the personnel who are involved or or may be impacted by an emergency or a disaster be trained at an appropriate, excuse me, at an appropriate level for their level of involvement or impact. And so, uh, the 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 level that an IACUC member might be affected or might be per be participating is probably very different than than the veterinary staff or the animal care staff. And and so, again, leaving it up to the institution to make that determination of of who needs what training and and what the what the, the level of training they need is. Uh, next slide, please. So we tried to provide as many resources as we could to to simplify this process for for our regulated facilities. So uh, we we have a whole section on our website with with lots of information. We developed two different tech notes. That's one's kind of a quick reference overview, and the, the other one is more of an in depth development guide. Uh, I mentioned the fillable form to, to again kind of guide you through a contingency plan, and then we've we've done a few webinars and conference presentations on on this requirement, and 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 still do that uh, when when asked or when that's of interest for facilities or for for groups. Uh, next slide, please. And so so again to to echo Susan and and Leslie's comments at the beginning, you know we. We at, at Animal Care feel like the contingency plan is important, but we want to know how important how effective it's been, um, both in terms of the plan itself and and our our rollout and implementation of the rule. So so basically, big picture is the contingency plan useful? Um, what what was development of the contingency plan like? How are facilities defining reasonably anticipated? Is that something that's too nebulous, or is it, or is that that helpful to to leave it to the facilities to determine what kind of interplay is happening between between IACUCs, the, the veterinary staff, um, environmental and health services at, at within the facility or emergency management units, um, at local authorities, police or fire? What kind of of outreach are facilities doing with with those other partners that might need to facilitate a response in an emergency? And are there nuances associated with with organization type based on the size, the species they're using, the location, uh, or any are any of those factors or others? What what kind of things didn't we think about that that facilities are experiencing that either help or 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 hinder this process? And are estimates for for the time requirements correct? How long did it take facilities to 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 generate their plans? How long does training take for staff? 
and what training methods are most effective and efficient? What, what kind of uh, documentation is used, uh, if any? And then uh, again, again, importantly, were the plans effective when needed? Um, are there common lessons learned of, of we should have had this in our plan or we didn't think of this uh, or this worked really well? Uh, what are those things that that we can try to share with the, with the larger community to, to help others before they experience an emergency? And then uh, what can APHIS do to improve compliance and effectiveness? So, so more of how did we do with the rollout and implementation of the rule? Were the resources we provided sufficient and effective? Was the time that 180 days to, to do your initial planning, was that sufficient or was that too much time? Um, and so these are important questions for us to understand as an agency for, for the contingency rule. And, and, and again, as we look to future rulemaking uh, processes. Um, so next, please. That's my last, yeah. Um, so so again, I, I thank you all for coming. And I, I again, hope that you'll participate and, and engage with us as, as we try to answer some of these questions over the next two days. So, so thank you all. Hey, thank you very much, Dr. DeFazente. Uh, right now, we're going to hold any questions that you guys might have for his presentation until after the uh, next presentation is completed. So the next presentation is going to be given by Dr. Taylor Bennett. So Dr. Bennett is currently a management consultant in the area of sound public policy and regulatory compliance, serving at the, as a sci senior scientific advisor for the National Association for Biomedical Research, also known as NEBER. He spent 36 years at the University of Illinois at Chicago, overseeing their animal care and use program, and then became the Associate Vice Chancellor for Research Resources, where he oversaw 14 campus-wide research support facilities. He served as the president of the Association of Primate Veterinarians, the American Association of Laboratory Animal Science, and the American Society of Laboratory Animal Practitioners. He has served as a member of the board of directors of the National Association for Biomedical Research, which he chaired, and the American College of Laboratory Animal Medicine. He currently serves as chair of the board of ASAP Foundation and on the board of directors of the Scientist Center for Animal Welfare. He obtained his director of his doctor of veterinary medicine at Auburn University and his PhD from the University of Illinois Medical School and is a diplomate of the American College of Laboratory Animal Medicine and a chartered diplomat of the American College of Animal Welfare. And with that, I'd like to turn it over to Dr. Bennett. Thanks, Leslie. And thanks, Lewis. And uh, for those of you who are listening, send in your questions because when we did our run through at the practice session, neither Lewis and I had a good understanding of how we were going to fill the time allotted. <laughs> Um, and I, I want to apologize a little bit up front for some redundancy in terms of my presentation and Lewis's as it comes to the regulations. But uh, uh, yeah, in my opinion, you can never get too much redundancy for the regulations if you need to follow them. So could I have the next slide, please? I want to give you a little background here on how we got to where, where we are today with this. When I began consulting with neighbor and serving as their senior scientific advisor, one of the things I initiated was a review and analysis of the USDA inspection process for research facilities, only for research facilities. This review involves reading all inspection reports, which are listed as having a citation on the animal care's public search tool, and then creating spreadsheets, which include sections cited along with the specific citation. I presented the first presented that data um, along with my analysis in a webinar reviewing the FY 2010 inspection data. That review and analysis has become our January webinar. In fact, this year's version was our 14th edition. Now the co-chairs reached out to me to see what data I had in terms of the citation involving compliance for research facility with the implemented regulation for contingency plan, which I happily provided and which I'm sure resulted in the invitation to be a participant in this workshop. So next slide, please. My plan for today is to present my review and analysis of the citations issued to research facilities. The regulations involving contingency plans are found as Lewis said in part two, Subpart C, Section 2.3, Miscellaneous, specifically uh, Subsection L on Contingency Planning. 
And as he said, the regulations include requirements for registered research facilities to develop, document, and follow an appropriate plan based upon identifying likely situations the facility might experience. I'm having trouble with my, my computer here. There we go. The plan must include an outline of the specific tasks required to be carried out in response to these situations and identifying a chain of command for those tasks, which is an important issue. The plan must also include how the facility will handle the response and recovery to the situation in terms of materials, resources, and the need for further training. As the plan had to be in place by July 5th, 2022, and the plan must be reviewed on an annual basis by the facility. The plan, as well as the documentation of the annual review, must be available during the inspection process and to any federal agency upon request, federal funding agency. The facility had to provide training within 60 days, as Lewis said, of adopting the plan and subsequently train new employees within 30 days of that start date, which is something I'll address later. Next slide, please. Now, for other registrants, and licensees, which include Class A breeders, Class B dealers, Class C exhibitors, Class T carriers, Class H intermediate handlers, and yes, a few research facilities, which were cited under 2134 contingency plans. I'll just present the numbers I downloaded from the public search tool for those because uh, there's no way I was going to be able to look at all those inspection reports. The requirements for 2.38 and 2.134 are almost identical except for the language involving funding agencies. Under two, It's not in 2.34, and 2.134 addresses requirements for traveling uh, entities, which are the exhibitors. Next slide, please. Some of the exhibitors. Now, this table includes the data I had on file for research facilities for FY 2020. 22 and 2023, and the data that was available in the Animal Care Public Search Tool at the time I submitted my PowerPoint. As you can see, in the first few months following the implementation of the regulations for research facilities, there were five citations involving contingency plans out of a total of 317 citations for the entire fiscal year. Moving on to 2023, the number is 27 of the five, yes, 518 citations issued to research facilities. For 2024, up through the inspection reports posted at the time I submitted the PowerPoint, there were five citations involving research facilities out of 138 total citations. And I, I put a little sidebar there. There were 60 more inspections in this fiscal year during the same time period than there were in previous years. Historically, the first quarter of the fiscal year is, has a very low number of inspections and these, it seems to be moving up. So I would expect more in, total inspections this year than in previous year. So since the implementation of the contingency plan regulation, research facilities have been cited 37 times for not complying with the regulations in 2.38. I'll address the citations under 2134 later. Next slide, please. Now, now, this slide depicts the most frequently cited sections for research facilities for FY 2023. And not surprisingly, the issues related to IACUC functions leads the list. And of those, 65% involve the semi-annual review and inspection process, and almost all of those involve smaller institutions, especially the community colleges and private vet tech programs. A distant sections, second are veterinary care issues and most which involve not reporting an issue to the AV or not following the treatment plan or other instructions for the AV. And the actual citations themselves are pretty much equally divided between actions or lack thereof by the husbandry staff and, and, and or the research staffs. The handling issues are largely issues that occurred and reported to the IACUC and then probably make up most of the critical citations that are cited during an inspection. The IACUC review activities mostly involves various justifications or explanations, uh, full descriptions of, that occur, uh, should be in the protocol and the proposals to conduct an activity involve uh, 
not following an approved protocol. So a distant six were the issues involving contingency plans. So even though this is a new uh, regulation, uh, there were uh, it it ranked in the top ten, for, which is unusual for uh, a, a program like this. I should note that this list does not include citations involving the standards because I want to be able to compare this to other data for licensees in terms of the regulations. And when you get into the uh, standards for the licensees, it would just be numbers I don't, didn't think I could deal with in the time I had to get ready. Slide seven, please. Next slide. Most of the citations involved either the facility not having a contingency plan or could not find the one they had during the inspection. Now, that may seem kind of ridiculous, but you'd be amazed the number of times facilities are actually cited for not being able to find the minutes to the RI cook when the <laughs> meetings, when the BMO comes around. This was followed by issues involving training, either having not done it or not having, uh, not being able to prove they did it, even though you don't have to have records. But the way the citations are, I'm sure they just ask and they said, that they didn't have any information on that. Now, several facilities had not documented that they'd done the annual review and revisions where necessary that is required. Seven of the facilities cited involve vet tech programs. I mention this again because they are the most cited type of facilities when it comes to the semi-annual review and inspection process. These types of uh, facilities just really don't have the, uh, the level of expertise that you see in the larger facilities in terms of your eye cook, eye cook staff, uh, veterinary staff, uh, facility managers, and this type of thing. Two of the facilities cited were cited for repeat non-compliances between 2022 and 2023. Next slide, please. Now, this table depicts the citations downloaded from the public search tool using the filter options for the Code of Federal Regulation. This is a really, really handy tool if you're looking for something. As was the case with research facilities, it appears that either not having a plan or not having it available was the most frequently cited issue. I say appears because I did not actually look at the inspection reports. The next most frequently cited issue appears to involve the annual review, which really doesn't surprise me because research facilities are used to some form of uh, uh, reviewed twice a year, and so rolling this in shouldn't be as big a problem. I was actually surprised that citations for issues involving training were as few as they were. Uh, let you soak in those numbers here a minute. Next slide, please. When I look at comparable data for FY 2023 for licensees and other registrants, Issues involving contingent plan was the number one followed by veterinary care issues. Again, I did not include a citation for the standards in this comparison with handling a distant third. Now, these numbers are compilations of just the subsections within the, the two sections that are comparable. Next slide, please. Now, this table depicts the number of citations of licensees and other registrants by class. And yes, as I said, there were citations issued to research facilities under 2134. This almost happens every year where a veterinary care issue uh, for a research facility is cited under 2.40, not 233. It is obvious that exhibitors are the most frequently cited facilities. Next slide, please. This table depicts the total number of citations involving the contingency plan regulations by class of facility, along with a percentage, which I put in quotes. Uh, and because it is, it compares the number of citations to the number of facilities and not to the number of actual total citations. That said, except for one research facility, it does not appear that inspectors are are using multi, issuing multiple citations involving the contingency plan regulations on an inspection report. So this does provide, I think, a big picture summary of which class of licensees or registrants are most cited. Next slide, please. I was surprised by the percentage on the previous slide for research facility because so many have had contingency plans in place 
for years. I was not surprised to see that seven of the facilities involved vet tech programs, because as I've said several times, they are frequently cited for other administrative issues, uh, su such as the semi-annual pro process. The fact that an equal number of ALAC accredited facilities were cited was a surprise because the citations were either for the existence of the plan or training personnel. Now, when I looked at the survey information, which is going to be presented later, I found it interesting. There were several responses in the survey that, that just assumed that all ALAC facilities would uh, pass with flying colors. Out of curiosity, I looked at the implementation of the veterinary care requirements for DOG, which took effect early in FY 2021, where there were also only a couple of citations followed by an increase that lasted for a couple of years and then appears what appears to be a drop off this fiscal year. It will be interesting to see if this pattern repeats with citations involving the clinical, the contingency plan regulations, particularly in research facilities. Next slide, please. Now, when I look at the resources that are available on the animal care website, and Lewis showed even several more, I could see how the tech note could be a little intimidating for a small facility, though the sample form should make it relatively easy to follow. It brought back memories of my experience with getting ready for the stroke of midnight when we entered the 21st century. I'd been director at the time for 22 years. We had what we thought and ALEC thought and everybody else was a good contingency plan. But working through all the things we would do, have to do, should the worst case scenario take place was really intimidating. Uh, you know, you have these plans in place, but what do you do if there's no power, there's no this, no that? One of the first things, of course, that came to our mind was, well, on January the 1st in Chicago, if nobody has heat, light, and power, we aren't going to have any workers anyway because they're going to head to where it's warm. So I, I can see how when you first start to sit down and take this in seriously, particularly for a smaller facility, that this could be intimidating. Next slide, please. In closing, for research facilities, the number of citations involving the contingency plan regulations make up only 4% of the total citations. Not surprisingly, most of the facilities cited appear to be smaller programs, which probably do not have the type of programmatic expertise as the larger facilities. The number of ALAC accredited facilities that have been cited was a surprise. Based on previous experience with the implementation of the vet care for dogs requirements, I think the number of citations for actually having a plan may have peaked, certainly for research facilities. Finally, next slide, please. Finally, hindsight is always 2020, and had the proposed rule been published today, I would have probably responded differently to the 30-day requirements for training new employees. The post-COVID staffing landscape and research facilities has changed and in some cases dramatically. Many facilities seem to be short-staffed most of the time, so bringing on new staff with little, little or no experience into what can be a very complex job takes time. It can take months to get new employees to the point where they would be given any responsibility other than for themselves in the case that a contingency plan had to be implemented. Had I known to uh, what I do today, I when I filed neighbors probably comments, I would have requested a 30-day time frame be applicable, not from the start date from the time the employee had completed their probationary period and were considered full-time employees. Having listened to Lewis's presentation today, I think what I would do if I was having to do this uh, at an institution today is I would exclude the new employees until we felt they were fully from the contingency plan, which would should be fine under the, the regulations until such time as they were really incorporated and had been accepted uh, through their probationary period and were gonna be full-time employees. So again, uh, I wanna thank the organizers for inviting me and look forward to hearing any questions. Hey, so we are gonna move into the uh, Q&A part of this session. People are certainly uh, encouraged to go ahead and put a couple of questions into your chat or into Slido, sorry. Um, 
In the meantime, there are a couple of questions that have already been submitted, which I'll go ahead and ask. The first is for Dr. Diva Zenta. Um, how does the USDA estimate the time to develop a contingency plan? You stated the estimate was four to six hours. Yeah, so I'm not I'm not sure. I mean, I think we, we <laughs> <laughs> so to be honest, I, I think um, you know, I think we go through a process of 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 us filling it out and and seeing what that process is like. Um, but but yeah, we're I don't have a good answer for that. Sorry. I appreciate your honesty on that one. <laughs> Next question, I think could go for both you guys. Of elaborating a disaster plan is a collective or multidisciplinary exercise. So it involves, you know, more functions, more accumulated time. Who do you guys think should be the key contributors to the contingency planning? So I, I'm going to take it back. We we leave it up to the facility to decide if if, if it's best in the IACUC, if it's best originating from the, the AV or from the, the animal resource management or from, from a facility has an emergency management unit or, in, or environmental services or or whichever unit it makes sense for, for the, the organization, depending on, on their processes. Um, certainly the, the animal care staff, um, vivarium staff probably need to have an oversized role in developing it because they're the ones that probably understand what the needs are. Um, but but in terms of who should lead it, uh, we'll we'll defer to the organization to decide what's what's best for them. Yeah, I, I think uh, coming from a large academic institution or even a smaller one that of course the animal care staff as directed by the attending veterinarian or whomever directs it, I think should be key to this, but as with everything in a, a one other group that needs to be involved is facilities management. Anyone who's managed an animal care program knows that your best friends and sometimes worst enemies can be facilities management. Um, if you have unions, you have to involve the union with this because if it's there's stuff in your plan that's not covered by the contract, it's it's not going to be <laughs> very successful. Uh, and Employee health and safety is another one. Um, we always had a member of uh, uh, employee health and safety on our animal care facility. Uh, our I cook and uh, we had a facility subcommittee, which they served on. But uh, your police, your public safety people at the institution. And of course, uh, they usually have the liaisons to the, the municipal uh authorities and everybody has to be on the same page in case a, a major issue comes up in Chicago. Now, we didn't have to worry about hurricanes or wildfires, but snow with the interesting thing is um, during all the years I was there, we've had some pretty good snowstorms and our people got to work. <laughs> uh, um, my coordinator at the time had a, uh, a theory that the closer you live to work, the more likely you were you wouldn't be there when you needed to be there. And it that did prove to be the case a couple of times. Hey, thanks. All right, another question that um, is in here is, you explain, and this is for Dr. Di Di Vicenta, you explained how the word contingency was selected for use in the term contingency plan. Many institutions already had a disaster or emergency plans. Can you comment on if these plans can be one and the same, or if, from the USDA's perspective, an institution's contingency plan must be a unique document? No, uh, of, 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 we, we don't require it to be a, a unique document. It, ha it has to meet all of our requirements, so it has to cover those, those four criteria that, that I went over within the framework. Um, but you can call it whatever you want to call it. You can um, do it with whatever, whatever format you want to do it as um, whichever, whatever, again, is most appropriate for you, um, that we call it a contingency plan and you call it a disaster plan. It, it, it can definitely be the same thing, again, as long as it meets our criteria. And I think my surprise to seeing some ALAC facilities being cited, I, I think probably what happened there, they just assumed what they had was appropriate, but because uh, the uh, ALAC is on a three-year cycle, they may not have updated it appropriately or uh, uh, something like this. It's uh, saw the same thing with some of big facilities after the uh, new rules for dogs were implemented in terms of veterinary care. They had all this in place, but they hadn't actually adopted it to the new 
wording in the regulations. So I, I guess I assume that's what happened just based on who was cited. Okay, I have another question. I was at Columbia University on September 11th, and we found that the contingency plan had to be quickly revised on the spot due to the fact that things happened that you could never anticipate. Can you guys comment on how this might be perceived by USDA and being compliant with the plan? Yeah, I mean, so so we we are requiring a process. Um, we uh, that's that's thought that's thoughtful. That's that occurs before things happen. Um, we recognize that there's definitely things that are unanticipated and uh, and that that are going to have to happen the circumstances and and what you know what the, what happens. Uh, we haven't uh, cited a facility for not following their plan. Uh, I don't anticipate that we would. Um, and and you know something that that I think Dr. Dr. Saberano, one of our our assist, uh, assistant directors, is is talking tomorrow, and I think he might talk a little bit about the citation issue. Um, we typically, we I think there's more citations in terms of when a, when something happens and there's a, there's a welfare problem with the animals as a result. Um, we're not citing the contingency plan. We're citing the handling or the or the the temperature problem or whatever, so that the citation might be somewhere else when when there is an animal welfare effect that uh, that we feel like should have been or could have been reasonably um, anticipated or prevented. So, um, so yeah, I think we're not we're not being aggressive about uh, about you follow follow the the plan without deviation. We we're recognizing that. It's it's just a guide. Um, it's going through a process that that hopefully is providing some preparation. I would agree. I I think the word disaster uh, cannot be planned for. Uh, um, years ago, I remember attending a luncheon meeting of ASLAP when they had a motivational speaker, and I was uh, never been a real fan of these type of talks. But he did say something that has stuck with me. He says, when it hits the fan, it doesn't equally distribute. And that's certainly the case when a disaster happens. Dr. Bennett, you're always a colorful speaker. Thank you. <laughs> All right, a couple other questions. Uh, can you describe any stakeholder feedback on the contingency rule that you've received, Dr. D. Pacenta? Um, no, uh, um, you know, just that I, I think, but, but beyond what, what I talked about with, with the initial rollout of of the, the burden that this might be, especially for, for smaller institutions and smaller facilities, which hopefully we've we've addressed. Um, we haven't, I'm, I'm not aware of anything specific that we've gotten since then. Okay, and a related question, how will the feedback from this workshop be used? So, so I mean, I don't, we're not like looking at, at rewriting the regulations, anything that broad, um, but we definitely are looking at um, but how we've implemented it, lessons learned for the future. Um, and certainly if there if there are things that we can do that will that will help with this rule or future rules, we'll we'll take that into into consideration and try to try to move on that to again help help the community um, and, and move forward with it. Okay, I think we're going to go ahead and conclude this part of the session. Um, I don't see any more questions coming in. So we will go to a break, correct? No, oh, we'll keep going, sorry. Over to you. So our next session will cover the results of two national surveys looking at contingency planning that was conducted independently. One survey was conducted by FASIB and one survey was conducted by our contingency planning workshop committee. We'll first cover the survey that was conducted by FASIB. Dr. Naomi Haralambakis will be presenting the FASTIB survey results, and Dr. Susan Harper and Dr. Leslie Colby, the contingency planning chair and vice chair, will present the survey results conducted by the workshop planning committee. Dr. Haralambakis is the associate director at FASTIB, a coalition of 22 scientific societies collectively representing over 110,000 individual biological and biomedical researchers. In this role, she leads efforts of FASTIB's Science Policy Committee, guiding a broad range of policy discussions and coordinating volunteers on future policy action opportunities. Additionally, Dr. Harlan Bacchus 
leads the Animals and Research and Education Subcommittee, developing policy statements, tracking congressional legislation and agency directives related to animal use in federal research, and creating resources for the lab animal community. Dara <laughs> Harry Bacchus launched her policy career of, at FASUB in November of 2018 after graduating with her doctorate in anatomical sciences and neurobiology from the University of Louisville School of Medicine, where she utilized mouse transgen transgenics to evaluate the role of retinal input on inhibitory interneurons in the visual thalamus. Over to you. Great. Well, thank you all so much for the opportunity to um, to be here at this workshop. I really appreciate all the organizers. Um, and I think we're going to start off with some polling first through Slido. Okay. Okay. Hopefully this is better sound. <laughs> okay. 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 And do we have the Slido slide? Yes. Okay. Perfect. All right. Thank you for everyone's patience. All right. The first question, I believe this is the first one. Did you participate in any surveys related to the USDA contingency planning rule? We just want to get a sense of what our audience is like. We're just watching the results come in. So awkward silence for everyone. <laughs> Okay, seeing that the results are starting to level off a little bit. The next one is, what is your role at your institution, facility, or company? Hey, let me put this on mute. And it was effective. It went on mute. <laughs> All right, we're seeing results come in. We have lots of attending veterinarians, IACUC administrative staff, IACUC members, institutional officials. So this is great. Broad range of, of folks in our audience. All right, I will move on to the next question just for the sake of time. Are you aware that USDA published a final rule in 2021 that requires regulated entities to develop a contingency plan? You can say no. If you really don't know, it's okay to say no. This is helpful information. Okay, great. That was an easy one. And I believe we have one more. Were you involved in the development and implementation of your institution's contingency plan? And in this context, implementation refers to the plan rollout and the training for everyone that's listed in the plan. This is helpful. Vast, vast majority are involved in both the development and implementation. That's great. Okay, we're seeing about 80-20. 
This is very helpful. Thank you, everyone. So that is a good setup and baseline for my presentation. Um, so today, I'm, I'm very happy to talk to everyone about the preliminary results that we have from the FASB survey on this contingency planning rule now that we are a couple years after it was, it was finalized. <clears throat> So first I will talk about the FASIB and USDA cooperative agreement that we entered about a year ago now and what led to this actual survey. Then I will give a brief overview of what our survey entailed, the setup and what the respondent demographics looked like. And then what everyone is hoping to see are some of the preliminary results. How is it going? How is the implementation? What are the pain points? Um, so that is the overarching um, scope of my talk today. So to give you a brief overview of this cooperative agreement that the FASIB and USDA APHIS entered into, so as part of the fiscal year 2023 omnibus bill, Congress provided more funding for USDA APHIS to support their ongoing contingency planning efforts. And that led to, in August of that, of 2023, to partner with FASIB to reach out and, and to conduct and ask us to conduct an evaluation survey to really seek feedback from stakeholders about implementation of the contingency planning rule. Is it going well? What, what could be improved? And this was a mutually beneficial opportunity. It not only advances FASIB's mission, which is to advance the biological and biomedical sciences, but it also can help enhance engagement between APHIS and the research community. So we are currently in the stages of drafting a report that will be summarizing all of the findings that we have from this survey um, and some, some draft recommendations for USDA APHIS to consider moving forward. So it's very stakeholder stakeholder based and we appreciate everyone's input, including what we hear from today at the workshop. Oh, too many. Okay, survey setup. So first I wanna preface this by saying that the scope um, for this is that the outcomes and the implementation are with respect to research facilities. So we didn't survey the zoos or, or aquatic uh, aquatic regions. So um, I wanted to be clear about that. So that led us, the most targeted group that we were looking at are the research investigators, IACUC members and administrators, attending veterinarians and institutional leadership. Now, the way we set up the survey, there were three routes, um, and you can see that in the schematic on the right. Um, depending on the awareness of the rule and what your involvement was, the questions changed as a result. So first is, are you aware of the USDA rule? And if you answered yes, you moved on to the next question. Are you involved? In, were you involved in the um, development and implementation of that plan? If yes, certain set of questions. If no, a different set of questions. And if you didn't know about the rule at all, it was a very short survey for you and you were taken to thank you for participating. And that was the end. Um, and I do wanna say too, that we did receive IRB exemption by FASIB's Protection of Human Subjects Committee in September of 2023 to protect all the participants anonymity. So we had four types of questions in our survey rule awareness and interpretation. And for this one, we asked things like, are you aware that the USDA issued a rule? And then one question that was really important was the rule requires entities to reasonably anticipate various situations that could affect animal health and emergency, for example. How does your facility interpret this language? So we wanted to see how that response varied. The second category was rule implementation. So we asked questions like, what steps did your facility take to create your plan? What departments were involved? Which parts of the, of the rule did you find useful, which were not useful? Then, of course, everyone's favorite category, administrative burden. This is where we asked things like, how much estimated time was actually required to generate your plan? The USDA has had its own estimates, but what did it actually take? Were the training timeframe requirements in the rule difficult to implement? And then the fourth category was areas for improvement. Um, this is where we asked, you know, are there things that USDA can be doing to help facilitate better implementation of this rule? So those were the questions. Um, and then before I dive into the results, just want to give a sense of what our participant pool looked like. Um, you can see here that the majority of the respondents, 69%, worked at a university or college, which is to be expected. But we did have a lot of responses from, you can see, 10% from biotech companies, 7% from USDA or other federal facilities. So this is a good range of, of, what, we of what we expected. Now, in terms of the respondent roles, so similar to what we asked the audience here today is what your role is at your facility, 
this is what our our participant role looked like. And there was a good broad range of roles here. We were very happy to see this. So good mix of attending veterinarians, IACUC members, including chairs. We also had um, IACUC administrative staff, animal care staff, institutional official, even university leadership. So this was really helpful in helping us figure out what, what the responses looked like and what that could mean. So we were very happy to see this broad distribution. And then finally, we also asked, what are the major species that are housed at your facility? And again, we saw a broad distribution here. We saw a lot of non-USDA regulated rodents and ferrets. Rabbits made up 18%, USDA regulated ferrets and birds, um, which is in the red, 15%, and USDA regulated farm animals. So this gives us a good sense too of the kinds of animals that are in facilities care. So now moving on to preliminary results. And again, I wish I could go through every question step-by-step step and share the results that we got, but this is just a snippet of some of the responses we saw from, from the survey. And I do wanna say that these are preliminary. And so our data analysis remains ongoing. It's, there's a lot of, of data to dig into, which is a good thing. So for today, I will talk a little bit about these topics, uh, the steps and amount of time that the respondents indicated that they needed to create a contingency plan, their awareness and the use of the form 7093 that Lewis and, and Taylor mentioned, the feasibility to complete the training in that required regulatory timeframe, whether contingency plans have changed since July 2022, and that's the date when rule, the plans needed to be in effect, whether facilities have an experienced an emergency since July 2021 and thus have had to use their contingency plan, and then when activated, how effective are those plans? And then any resources that USDA can, can help create to better and better increase understanding and implementation. So for a lot of this data, I'm also going to break it down by facility type and role in the institution just to give you a better sense of what that data looks like and what who is responding how. So first, um, we asked the basic questions, are you aware of the rule and were you involved in the plan development and implementation? vast majority of respondents are aware of the rule at 92%. That's a good thing. That's great. And 82% of our respondents um, were also involved in the development of their plan and implementation. So that was really helpful. But we did get a good sense from those that answered no, what they felt um, about the rule, what could be done to increase understanding to improve implementation. So it's helpful to have both sides. Moving on, we asked, you know, what steps did you take to create your contingency plan? For those that were involved, what steps did you take? And the largest number of facilities, as you can see in red, 39%, um, they already had a plan in place. So Lewis mentioned that, you know, you don't have to create something entirely new. If you had something in place and it met the stipulations of the regulation, those four criteria, then you can use that. So a lot of facilities at 39% went ahead and stated that they already had a plan that existed prior to the rule, no new actions were needed. But for those that did not, we saw that 18%, so the largest of those that did not, they formed a committee with various representatives, and that included attending veterinarians, IACUC members, IACUC administrative staff, some emergency staff planning and, and health and safety departments. So that was also helpful to see how people were creating their plan. Then we asked, are you aware of the optional form of 7093? Um, and you can see on the left here that 65% were, were aware that this, that this form existed. And when we break this down by role, we can see too um, who said yes and who said no. And what I like to do with these graphs too is I like to see, you know, okay, what is less than 65%? What which of those rules here? And you can see that animal care staff and research investigators were less likely to know about the form 7093 because they were less than the 65%. But overall, these were encouraging numbers to see that for the most part, most, most people were aware of this optional form to help them create contingency plans. Now we asked, you know, how did you use the form? Because you could we asked, you know, did you use it entirely and you submitted that as your plan or did you use it to help create your own format of a plan or did you just not even use it at all? So I wanted on the left here, I have just language from the final rule that states, you know, USDA Animal Care has created an optional form that entities may use. Um, and it's it's in the language quite a bit for for stakeholders to understand and know. 
from those results, you can see that you know, 46 percent indicated that they used Form 7093 to help facilitate the development of their own plan, just in a different format. And, and that makes sense. 19 percent used the form completely and used that as their form only. And then 35 percent did not use the form 7093 at all. So that was that was also interesting to us. And on the next slide, you can see the same, same results are on the left again, but I've broken it down by facility type. So what I saw here was the 19 percent of those that used a completed plan as their plan were at USDA or federal facilities, university or colleges. That makes sense because that was the majority of our respondents uh, and biotech companies. A lot of them just used the form 7093 as, as their version of the contingency plan. So this is, of course, interesting data as well. And then, so the the ultimate question, how much time did it take you to make your plan? So I want to remind folks that the final rule stated, we estimate it will take one to two hours per entity to complete the plan. And that is, of course, taking into account with the form, hoping that that will alleviate some of that time burden. Um, so interestingly, in our in our in among our respondents, you can see here that 42% indicated it took them 15 hours or more to develop their plan. Um, and then about 19% took over 10 hours, 25% took five to nine hours, only about 14% took less than five hours. When we look at that breakdown from facility type, that's pretty consistent across facility type as well. So this was interesting to us. Um, and I think it's it's also informative for the USDA to understand, oh, maybe we didn't estimate this correctly. So this of course is just, you know, some data from our survey and it always dependent on who is taking the survey, of course. Training, um, the other, the other uh, big question, um, we wanted, we wanted to ask, you know, are these time frame requirements and, and when training has to be done, was that burdensome for your facility? In the final rule, it states 60 days needs to be um, implemented for initial training and 30 days for new employees and any substantive changes that are made to the plan has to be, um, that training has to be done. So overall, though, two thirds indicated that the training time frame requirements were not burdensome. Of the third, and I will show in later slides what that looks like, but you can see that breakdown by respondent role um, across university leadership, iCook administrative staff, it's pretty consistent. Um, I think what jumped out at me with this data is attending veterinarians were a little bit more likely to say that um, the requirements were burdensome, but that is not statistically significant. Now, what was interesting with our surveys, we had a lot of room for open text comments. So for this one, we did say, if you found this burdensome, why and how? So several respondents who found it burdensome felt that the 30-day window for new employees is the most difficult. And a lot of these comments were really interesting. For example, adjunct staff are hired in June, but don't typically start working till late August. How are they going to be able to finish that training in that 30-day window if they're not physically there. Um, new employees is already an, uh, already an overwhelming time. They have a huge amount of training to already do, especially burdensome for new hires. Um, so we saw this over and over again in a lot of the comments, and I wanted to share some snippets here. Uh, then we asked, um, have you amended your plan since July 2022? And that, again, is the date when plans needed to be in place per the rule. Um, and 50% said, yes, they have amended their plan since July of 2022. Um, and so that, that, that was interesting. But more importantly, what prompted those changes? Um, and 48% indicated that the annual review, which, again, is a requirement that is listed in the final rule, is what prompted them to make the changes. So that's an effective component of, of the policy. Others indicated that, you know, maybe activating the plan, lessons learned, of course. 17% said feedback from employees. You know, maybe they saw the saw the plan and said, oh, that, that does need to be changed. So this was interesting as well. The comment section, of course, is always interesting to us. And we took us a lot of time to look through all of the one one-off responses. But feedback from our M... VMO, the veterinary medical officer, was one of the highest 
answers that we saw consistently. So the veterinary medical officer indicated you need to change this and that forced them to change the plan. USDA inspections, um, maybe a citation like Taylor was talking about. APHIS asked us to include blah, blah, blah. Um, so that was that was really interesting to us. It was all very prompted from the federal agency side uh, and some indicated IACUC feedback. Now, how many have experienced an emergency since the time when plans needed to be in effect? That was 34%. So most, two, over two thirds indicated that no, they had, did not experience an emergency. And when asked what type of emergency took place since July, 2022, it was primarily electrical outages, a faulty HVAC system, water quality and leaks. Um, and you can see that data here, where it was primarily electrical outages were were you know, over a quarter and faulty HVAC systems took up 25%. The comments were interesting here. Again, we had quite a few comments indicate smoke from Canadian wildfires. In case you remember, you know, several points last year, we had quite a bit of smoke problems and from the Canadian wildfires, as well as the ones taking place in California, that a lot of folks did not anticipate in their plans and so had to either go back and amend it or, you know, kind of think on the fly how to account for those. Um, we also saw staffing shortages. Some folks are really experiencing some residual effects from the pandemic, frequent fire alarms. Um, so these were all very insightful information for us. Now, the end all be all question, are the contingency plans working? Are they effective in an emergency? So I do wanna remind, although you've seen it a lot, you'll probably see it a lot throughout the workshop. In the final rule, documented contingency plans require four key criteria. Identify the situations, outline the specific tasks, identify that chain of command, and address how response and recovery will be handled in terms of backup materials and training. So we wanted to know, you know, aside from the emergency situations that needed to be identified, what, how well did these three criteria work? Did the specific tasks outline outline everything it needed to outline? Was the chain of command what it needed to be? You know, how was your contingency plan working in an emergency? So for the first one, outline a specific specific task. 99% of respondents, of those that experience an emergency, of course, 99% of respondents stated that their plans address the specific tasks either very well or satisfactory in an emergency. When you break that down by facility type, um, it's pretty consistent as well. Um, the university or colleges were more likely to say just satisfactory. Um, we had one indicate not well at all. And then of course, we always ask follow-up questions. For anything, if you stated not anything other than satisfactory or very well, we asked what could be improved. Chain of command, which is that sec uh, the third criteria, 97% of respondents stated their plans address the chain of command very well or satisfactory. Um, here it was interesting, we had a lot more less than satisfactory answers and um, on this slide, you can see that those answers that indicated that the chain of command was less than satisfactory, it came from the university leadership, IOs, IACUC administrative staff, and animal care staff. So that's really informative because they have different perspectives on the contingency plans and how they're rolled out. So we wanted to break that data down for in that way. And then finally, response and recovery. 97% of respondents stated that their plans did address the materials and the resources needed um, after an emergency and how to prepare for a recovery very well or satisfactory. Um, and you can see that breakdown on the right by facility type again. Um, of course, we had the most answers from university or, or colleges, so you'll see um, more distribution there, but it's it's still very insightful data. And then on the this slide, you can see, well, if it wasn't satisfactory, what what role did they have at the at their facility? And again, the, the less than satisfactory answers came from IACUC members and staff and animal care staff, the ones that are directly handling the animals, which is which is very important. So I think it's important to maybe follow up with those folks, folks specifically. What are we missing from contingency plans? What might need to be done um, to better prepare in the future? Areas for improvement. So this is um, close to the end of the survey, and we just asked a couple questions about that. But what I did want to highlight is the existing re USDA resources and guidance, which um, Lewis mentioned as well. Um, so 
it's a little hard to find the guidance just just from me and I'm I do this for for a living I look and breathe and read policy all day long so but even for me it was a little difficult to find the the resources for this topic you go to the APHIS home go to animals animal welfare animal welfare services and activities contingency planning and training of the personnel role but once you get there there's a lot of great information here. There's the summaries, there's related links, although the links are at the very, very bottom. Buried in all of that text is this form, is this text here that points you to the optional form uh, 7093 to create your contingency plan. Um, but again, it's a little bit hard to navigate and not really user friendly from, from my personal opinion. So knowing um, that, so some of, it would be understandable if a lot of folks did not know where to find some of these resources. So when we ask the question, what resources could USDA provide to facilitate implementation? We saw that a lot of folks, 32% wanted example contingency plans. At 26%, there were um, folks wanted a centralized FAQ document. 22% indicated training videos or classes could be helpful. 17% indicated additional guidance documents. You know, that's just a general term. And some comments regarding resources from respondents were, were quite informative as well. This one I have in red was probably the one that piqued our interest the most. Coordinated summary from inspectors as we hear different things being asked by different inspectors. So there's a consistency problem here. So facilities might hear one thing from one inspector and then the, at the next inspection hear something else. Um, so it, it makes it difficult on their side on what changes to be made. Guidance for vet tech schools. So it's interesting with seeing Taylor's citation data, um, a lot of the, the citations may be coming from smaller institutions or folks that, you know, don't do or house research uh, with animals, and they may need specific tailored guidance for, for this aspect of the rule. Additional sessions with OLA to discuss harmonization and or differences. Uh, there's still this misunderstanding that we have to have a separate contingency plan for USDA, and that's just not true. The final rule does state that, you know, if you have something in place, feel free to use it so long as it does, you know, uh, fulfill the four criteria. Um, a better template. Some A lot of comments actually indicated the template was not was not user friendly and it didn't allow for for them to add additional pages. So again, we're we're still digging through a lot of the comments, but these are some that that stuck out to us the most. Um, so just to summarize, um, and then we can kind of compare the data from the National Academy survey. Um, a predominant number of respondents already had a contingency plan in place, and among those that did not, numerous facilities spent more than fifteen hours preparing their plans. Awareness of that optional form 7093 is high, but the largest number of respondents indicated they only used it to just create their own format of a plan. The annual review was the predominant reason facilities amended their plan since July of 2022. Many respondents feel that that 30-day training time frame for new employees and or significant changes is too short. Most respondents have not experienced an emergency since July of 2022, but those that did, they stated that the contingency plan worked well, very well, or satisfactory in all three of the categories we asked. Respondents, and finally, respondents expressed interest in additional resources to enhance implementation, and we saw that nearly a third felt that ex example contingency plans would be the most helpful. So that summarizes the, the FASAB data. This is my, my email. Um, in case folks would like to reach out at, at any time, I'm happy to answer questions, which we will do after the next session. Thank you, Dr. Harlan Bacchus. We're going to take a 15-minute break. After the break, Dr. Leslie Colby and Dr. Susan Harper will present the findings from the NASM survey, and then that'll be followed by a Q&A. Thank you. <laughs> 